Um, and we'll, people will, I'm sure, will trickle in as we're, as we're uh, going forward in our presentation. Um, so over the next few days, we'll be talking about evangelism. And today we're going to lay the groundwork. Then tomorrow, um, we're going to talk about relationships and evangelism. Critical, critical, critical relationships and evangelism. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. And uh, you'll see through our presentation tomorrow that um, if we can build a relationship with somebody as we're studying the Bible with them or, or trying to win them to Christ, then when it comes time for testing truths, it will go so smooth uh, rather than just focusing on the doctrine. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And um, then on Friday, we're going to... Um, we're going to look at how to give a Bible study, a life-changing, powerful, very personal Bible study. Um, because if we don't make the Bible study personal to the person that we're studying with, what good is it? It's not relevant. So, example, Daniel 2 is a great story. But what does it have to do with Kevin as you're studying with Kevin? So we're going to take that regular Daniel 2 that we're all so familiar with and we're going to really make it personal for the people. And, and you watch and see as you give Bible studies that way how smooth the Bible study goes. I guarantee you, I will tell you, since I've been doing this, I've studied with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and I've probably only lost two or three Bible studies that I, that I started with people. And is it because of me? Certainly not, but it's because of the things that I'm going to be sharing with you guys um, from my own experience. So today, we're going to actually begin with um, why evangelism. So we're going to be talking about evangelism um, through the next few days. So I guess a good question would be, um, why evangelism? And so let's, uh, let's pray together before we get started. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your wonderful goodness and mercy. We thank you for the blessings that we've received already uh, through this camp meeting. I thank you for the message this morning and uh, just how you uh, speak to us in every message. And now as we begin to look at evangelism, as we look at this presentation here today, why evangelism? I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be present with us uh, dwelling in us, not just here with us, and I pray that you would speak to us uh, and open our eyes, Lord, to help us to see what you would have us to see here today, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The pastor sat quietly in his study. He had been a fairly new pastor when all of a sudden a knock came at his door. And he opened the door, and it was a group of his church leaders, the elders and deacons. And they said, Pastor, we need to talk to you. And so he said, of course. And so he brought them in. And they, the head elder said, you know, you've only been here for six months, Pastor, and all you keep talking about is evangelism. You know, we've been quite comfortable here through the years. And your strong emphasis on evangelism we can't understand because isn't soul winning mainly for the pastor? And so this is a good question because a lot of people have this idea that winning souls is for the pastor, the paid clergy. And um, we're going to take a look at that. What does Ellen White say on this? Desire of Ages 822. What is that first part of the sentence? It is a fatal mistake. What does the word fatal mean? Deadly. It means deadly. So it is a deadly, a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. So if I believe that winning souls is for the ordained minister, the clergy, then it is a fatal mistake that I am making. And uh, we talked last night about how the only way we can receive the character of Christ is if we are involved in the work, according to Spirit of Prophecy. So here, it's a fatal mistake to suppose the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. And so we're going to take a look at, um, actually, I don't, seven or eight points that we're going to bring out on biblical evangelism. Why should we be doing biblical evangelism? 
So the first one is evangelism is heaven's means of building up the body of Christ, the church. Uh, Acts chapter 2, we're very familiar with this chapter, verse 42 and then verse 47. Then they gladly received his word. They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Then verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. And so we see that evangelism is heaven's ordained means of building up the body of Christ, the church. Number two, evangelism is heaven's way of personal spiritual growth. And this is one that a lot of us don't understand. A lot of people don't understand that evangelism is actually a great way for our own spiritual growth. Desire of Ages 143, in order to develop a character like Christ, we must work as he worked. And so as we work as he worked, then spiritually we are going to grow. Fundamentals of Christian Education 227. If we would be saved at last, do we want to be saved? We want to be saved, right? Especially now. You know, let's stop here for a second. What I think is the saddest thing that could take place is when Christ comes back the second time, there will be, no doubt, many Seventh-day Adventists that will be waking in the, in the second resurrection. We are a people that has the truth. We are a people. We are the last day remnant people. Now, certainly not because we're any better than anyone else. But God has chosen us into this movement, and what a privilege that is. God has given us the truth that is going to prepare the whole world for the second coming of Christ. What a privilege. And some of us have that, and we are not going to make it when Christ comes. That, to me, is very, very sad, and I, I pray that none of us here will be among that group. So if we would be saved at last, we must be drawn out of our own selves, and the only way to do this is to become intensely interested in the salvation of others. So we must, if we're going to be saved, we must be drawn out of ourselves. We can't be focused on ourselves, me, me, me. You know, a lot of times, and don't get me wrong, our focus is we've got to get out of the cities. We should. And our focus is we've got to have the right diet, and we should have the right diet. And all these things, the right dress code and, and all this, this is all good things. But if that's our main focus, then our focus is where? It's on me. Me, me, me. But so here she says, if we, and those are all good things, and we need to be doing those things, especially in these days that we're living. But that shouldn't be our main focus. Our main focus should be a connection with Christ, and then as we have that connection with Christ, it's just going to be natural to want to win people for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? If we would be saved at last, we must be drawn out of ourselves, and the only way to do this is to become intensely interested in the salvation of others. So I'll ask the question and don't answer it today. Are we intensely interested in the salvation of others? Don't answer that, but it's a thought question for you. Number three, evangelism is heaven's means of unifying the church. Now let me ask you a question. Do we need unity in our own church? Do we need, are we living in a time that we need to be unified? Right, we've got some issues in our church and we're on the brink of some major issues in our church with things that are taking place where the world is coming in and worldly standards and, and um, LGBT and all these things. This is going to change some things in our church, in our schools. We're going to be faced with some major, major issues, especially our schools that, have, that are receiving government funding. Because already we see in California, and it's going to spill all the way across the country, laws that are, uh, are going to put our schools that are receiving funding from the government in very difficult situations. 
And so we are living in a time, and then of course the women's ordination and on and on. We've, we've got some issues in our church. You know, if you don't have issues in your church, you better figure out what you're doing wrong. <laughs> right? Because the devil is working. The devil hates Seventh-day Adventists. Do you believe that? He hates Seventh-day Adventists more than any people group in the world because God has given us the message that is pulling people from his kingdom in these last days by the busload. And so evangelism is heaven's means of unifying the church. You know, if if we're a part of a church, a local church, and our main focus is evangelism, so you go to a board meeting and you don't hear anymore that, you know, we don't have money for evangelism. We don't have money to do a series. Uh, You go into a board meeting and the number one priority, the very first line item on that board meeting is evangelism. I don't know if it's like that in your church, but uh, I've sat in on a lot of board meetings and it's usually down the bottom, evangelism. And after all the money has been taken for different things, then we we take the leftover for evangelism. But evangelism is what unifies the church. When we're, our main focus is winning people to the kingdom of heaven, then all of a sudden it doesn't matter what color the carpet is that two families have been fighting over for eight years. All these things go away when we're focused on evangelism. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so when we receive the Holy Spirit, uh, why do we receive the Holy Spirit? To witness, right? And, And so we're told the Holy Spirit is poured out on those that obey. So Jesus said, witness for me. We have a great commission. And that great commission is to get the gospel to the whole world, right? We saw that in Matthew 24 yesterday, and of course, the great commission is Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Actually, it backs up to verse 16, but uh, goes to to verse 20. So when we are involved in evangelism, we will be united, and a lot of our problems as a church will go away. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, the promise was you would receive power when the Holy Ghost comes. Now, did Jesus pour out the Holy Spirit right then and there on his disciples? No. They went to the upper room for how long? How long? Ten days. And what did they do during that time? They prayed, and and very interesting, you look at the writings of Ellen White on this, they were studying the life of Christ. And then things started opening up and they started to understand he was supposed to be crucified, he was supposed, everything was lining up. And as they studied the life of Christ, they saw themselves how filthy they were. You know, just before the, so so Jesus says, I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit, blah, blah, blah. And the disciples said, so at this time, are you going to set up your kingdom? They still didn't get it. After three and a half years, they still didn't get it. And we shake our heads, right? What is wrong with these people? We would have been the same, (laughs) right? Let's not mistake it. And so I can just imagine Jesus shaking his head like, oh boy, I got to pray extra for you guys. And so the promise was right there. Ten days later, as they studied the prophecies of Christ, and they prayed together. Then they saw things. At first they saw how filthy they were. They were f- still fighting who was going to be uh, in the top, who was going to be right there next to Christ in his new kingdom and so on. They, all of a sudden, self didn't matter. They understood their mission, what God was calling them to do. They were unified. And once they were unified, then the Holy Spirit was poured out in early reign power. And we know what the result of that was, thousands and thousands and thousands got baptized in the name of Christ. Heaven's means of bringing joy to God's heart. Would you like to bring joy to God's heart? Who would like to bring joy to God's heart? Imagine, we, filthy creatures, can actually bring joy to the heart of God. We see in Luke chapter 15, very familiar with this, three back-to-back-to-back parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So we have the lost sheep. We know the story. The lost sheep, he, he wanders off inadvertently. Didn't mean to be lost. 
But one step led to another. You know, a lot of times we don't mean to be in a situation we're in. But one sin makes it easier to commit another sin, which makes it easier to commit another. All of a sudden, we realize we are completely lost. This is the lost sheep. He realized, now the sheep didn't know it was lost until it, it was almost dead. And this sheep is on the brink of death, completely lost. And I love this story because Jesus goes out after that sheep, leaving the 99 and rescuing that sheep and bringing it back. Now, did Jesus say, now, now listen, look at your condition now. See what happens when you, when you walk away from me? Is that what he said? No. Did he say, all right, get back into that fold? No. He picked up that thing and put it on his shoulders and carried it back. I love that story. And then we see in verse 7 that there is joy in heaven when one sinner repents. Then we come to the lost coin. We know the story. Where was the coin lost? In the house. What does the house represent? The church. Did you know church doesn't save anybody? Or we should go to church, right? Do not forsake the assembling of the saints. We need to be in church, but church doesn't save anything. The only thing that saves people is a relationship with Christ. And so this coin is lost in the church. Does it know it's lost? Doesn't know it's lost. Are there people in that condition in our church? Certainly are. A lot of our young people are in that condition. Church doesn't save anybody. But so we see, the again, uh, the aggressiveness in going after that coin. And we see in verse 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God when that happens. And then we know the lost son. The son knows exactly what he's doing. He purposely walks away from God feels like he's missing out on all the fun in the world, much like our young people do. And, um, and we know the story. He finds himself down in the gutter after blowing all the money, and he comes up with his long speech, comes back, and we see the father waiting for him. The father runs out to meet him, hugs him, kisses him on the neck, tears. The son begins his speech, and he cuts him off, brings him into the house, and we see that there was joy in the house of God when one sinner re returns. And so we can bring joy to the heart of God by involved, being involved in evangelism. Number five, evangelism is heaven's ordained means of finishing God's work on earth. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So the gospel is going to be preached to the whole world before the end comes. So evangelism is going to increase more and more until the whole world is enlightened with God's message. God has purposed it, and it is sure to come. Revelation chapter 18, we see this. Revelation 18, beginning in verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power. What kind of power? Great. great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, excuse me, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So here in Revelation chapter 18, we're familiar with this. You have Revelation chapter 14 with the three angels' messages. Then Revelation 18, you have a fourth angel that joins that third angel of Revelation 14. And when that angel in Revelation 18 joins the third angel in Revelation 14, then it gives that message great power. And of course, Revelation, um, the third angel's message in Revelation 14 is, is a repeating of the second angel's message, going into detail, if you will, of the second angel's message. And so when this happens, there's great power, and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. And who are the people that are involved in this? How is the whole earth going to be lightened with God's glory? We are the ones that are involved in this. We are the ones preaching 
the everlasting gospel, the first angel's message. And very interesting, Ellen White had a vision. I don't want you to read that yet. Ellen White had a vision. And it's concerning the very last days right before Christ comes. And it's found in, I believe, uh, seventh volume of the Testimonies. And she sees in this vision something very, very interesting that's connected with Revelation 18, 1 to 4. It says, In visions of the night, representations pass before me of a great reformatory movement among God's people. So who are God's people? You and I. So she sees among you and I a great reformatory movement. Many were praising God, the sick were healed, and other miracles were wrought. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families and opening before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me stop there for a minute. Ellen White sees in a vision right before Christ comes a reformatory movement taking place amongst us, and what is taking place in this reformatory movement? Hundreds and thousands of families are seeing, being seen going into the community, knocking on doors. They're visiting families and they're opening the word of God in their homes. And as they're doing this, conversions are being made, people are being healed, and so on. And they were, hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest. Now check this out. On every side, doors were being thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. Anybody ever gone door to door before? Anybody ever gone door to door to get a Bible study before? Anytime you've gone door to door, has there ever been a time where you turned onto Main Street and all of a sudden, all the doors start flying open on both sides to welcome you. <laughs> that happens all the time, right? <laughs> I've done a lot of door-to-door -door all over the place in different parts of the world, and I will tell you, I have never once had that happen. Matter of fact, I've had the opposite. <laughs> I come to that first door, and that person gets on the phone and calls the neighbors, and all the doors start getting bolted and the shades pulled down. But here, in the very last days, a reformatory movement among God's people, you and I. People are being healed from the sick, from being sick. Miracles are being wrought. People, you and I, are going into homes and studying the Bible with families. Conversions are, are happening. A great power of the Holy Spirit is working through us. And as we go down the streets, doors are being flown open on both sides. This is amazing. The world seemed to be lightened with the heavenly influence. Great blessings were received by the true and humble people of God. So let me ask you a question. So evangelism is what feeds us. Evangelism is what brings life to Seventh-day Adventists. So here we see what's taking place. And at the very end, that last sentence, great blessings were received by who? The humble people of God. The great blessing is received by us. And so many times, I think, this is why a lot of times when you do a, a, an evangelism training, the place isn't full. You go to a church and do an evangelism training and 20 people out of the 150 that go to church come out for the evangelism training because we don't understand that the great blessing is on us as we go forward with this message. And I will tell you, this is what brings life to the church member. Now, I want you to think about this. She saw this in vision right before Christ comes. She could have seen your face in this vision. Think about that. She could have seen my face. You know, there's a lot of people we want to see when we get to heaven, right? A lot of biblical characters and so on. Ellen White is one of those people that I'm sure we all want to see when we get to heaven. And uh, we want to see everybody, but, you know, there's particular people. But think about this. We get to heaven, and Ellen White is there, and she says, Brother, 
I saw you in vision. How did that Bible study end up with that family you were studying with? Think about that. She saw in vision God's people, you and I, at this time. We're living at the very end of time. And so she could have seen you and I going door to door studying with people. She could have seen the doors being flown open as you were walking down the street. What a scene that is. So what's going to be a result of this? A second Pentecost. Thousands are going to be converted in a day. The light of truth will penetrate everywhere. Every believer will be enlisted in the work of evangelism. Let me stop there. How many believers? Every believer. Uh, this is almost surreal. Every believer will be involved in evangelism. We know what's going to happen, right? The, the great shaking and majority of the church members are going to leave. Not only are they going to leave, but they are going to join the ranks of the enemy and become our bitter, bitterest enemies. I pray that none of us will be on that side. None of us. And what is going to keep us from that? Of course, studying our Bible. Of course, praying personally and corporately. And of course, it, we have got to be involved in evangelism. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everybody's got to go door to door. That's not what I'm saying. Everybody's got to study the Bible with somebody. That's not what I'm saying. Everybody's got to be a preacher. No, no, no. But we must be involved in evangelism at some level, at some level. I understand there are some people that can't go door to door. Physical uh, issues uh, don't allow them to. But everybody's got to be involved in evangelism. We've got to be involved in soul winning. If we want the Spirit of God poured out upon us in latter rain power, we've got to be involved in soul winning at some level. And um, I praise God that every believer is going to be enlisted in the work of evangelism. Thousands of laymen will be seen going from home to home, opening the Word of God to everyone who will hear. Evangelism brings life to the church. Do you believe that? Ellen White says this. Now, let me back up for a second. We have the Great Commission. Where do we find the Great Commission? Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 19 to 20, 18 to 20. Yes, very good. But if we, now, this is interesting. If we back up two verses, to verse 16. Do you have your Bibles? Matthew chapter 28. I want to show you something. Because I've had this a lot of times when I do a church training. I've had people say this to me. Matthew chapter 28, so we have the Great Commission, but we, we usually start a little bit late. So back up to verse 16, says, then the 11 disciples, how many disciples? 11. Why 11? Judas had hung himself already, right? Unfortunately. The 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some, what's that word? Doubted. Doubted. So get this picture. Jesus is about to give to his disciples the great commission to Proclaim the gospel to the whole world. He's about to begin the Christian church. And some doubted. It doesn't say one doubted as in Thomas. It says some doubted. The disciples had issues. Can you agree with me on that? Here he's about to give the greatest commission ever given to humankind. And some still doubted who he even was. Now, so Jesus then did this. He said, okay, now, did Jesus know that some doubted? What do you think? Of course he did, right? So he said, okay, you guys uh, over here, no offense, just illustration. Okay, you guys over here, you're doubting. Um, I'm going to come back and talk to you. I'm going to give the great commission to these guys because they're not doubting. Is that what he did? He gave the great commission to a group of people where some of them even doubted. Even doubted. Why did he do that? <coughs> that doesn't sound like it's gonna be very effective? Why did he do that? Why did he give the Great Commission to people that even doubted who he was? Because he knew exactly what they needed. If you're struggling in your walk with Christ, 
the best thing to do is to get out there and work for him. Jesus knew as these disciples doubted when they got out there and the Holy Spirit was working through them in the things that they were going to witness and see, he knew that was going to be the very thing that would lead him closer to him. You will never be as close to Christ as when you are working with him, side by side with him. So don't ever think, you know, you know, evangelism's good, but it's not for me. I got too many issues. I got too many sins in my life. Don't let that stop you from witnessing. Don't let it stop you. Give those sins to Christ, but don't let anything stop you from the Great Commission. I've had many times people say, you know, Kevin, it's great. You know, we do this church training, and I always, um, it's almost, you can almost hear the butt coming. But, you know, our church, we got a lot of problems right now. There's a music war, and there's a women's ordination war, and, you know, I don't think we should be involved in evangelism right now. Well, if you've got a lot of problems in your church, that's exactly when you need to be involved in evangelism because that's what's going to unify the church, and that's what's going to bring life back into that church. I love this quote, Desire of Ages 825, the very life of the church depends on her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. Did you catch that? The very life of the church, and if you'll allow me, I'm going to switch one word. The very life of the church member depends on her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. To neglect this work, the other side of the coin, is to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. So... How many of you here would like to be spiritually feeble and decaying? Anybody? If you walk into a church and there's no life in that church, the first thing you can know is they're not involved in evangelism. They're not involved in the Great Commission. Because if they were, it would bring life to that church. I want to illustrate this. This here is a picture, if you can see it, of a church. Um, in the Ukraine. Now, I took a call to the Ukraine some years ago to start a, a, an AFCO school, an Amazing Facts um, evangelism school. And I had already been back and forth uh, to and from the Ukraine for a couple of years at that time and had been teaching uh, pastors, leadership, lay members, and uh, we, we trained some Bible workers. They had never had Bible workers in the Ukraine. And so we would train them. So in the morning, I would train the leadership. In the afternoon, I would train these Bible workers. And then in the evening, we would have a church training. And I uh, did this for eight days straight. And so the first time I went there, I'm training the leadership and pastors in this one conference. And it's not going so well. And the pastors are getting upset with me, and I could tell. And so my translator's getting a little uneasy, and this one pastor gets up as I'm talking about we're going to be going door to door, excuse me, door to door, and doing the cycle of evangelism. And the pastor gets up and he says, Kevin, you can't do that in this country. It doesn't work. This is, we used to be Soviet Union, we're post-Soviet Union. This is not America. This does not work here. And I said, I'm sorry, Pastor, the last time you tried this the way I'm teaching it, it didn't work. And he ignored the question. And he said, you can't do that here. This is the Ukraine. It's not America. And I said, I'm sorry, Pastor. So the last time you tried it this way I'm teaching you, it didn't work. And he said, well, I've never tried it, but it can't work here. And so that always sat in the back of my head. Now, a couple years later, I come back as the director of, a, of an AFCO school and we're gonna do that very thing. <clears throat> so whenever we would have a semester, the first thing I would do is train church members. And so I go to the Ukraine and I do an eight day training and it ends on Sabbath afternoon. And the plan is Sabbath afternoon after the last training, we're gonna go out into the community, all of us, and we're going to knock on people's doors and get Bible studies. Now. For the church member, if you don't want to keep those Bible studies, maybe you're afraid, maybe whatever, you don't want to keep them, give them to us. I'll give them to our students. They'll be glad to take them. And so that was the plan. So we had 67 church members to go out into the community at the end of this training, which was 
a miracle in itself. Now, it had never been done before in the Ukraine, never. On top of that, we're in this small city that is, you're either Catholic there or you're Orthodox. Orthodox Church runs Eastern Europe, but you're, which they're one and the same, really. So you're either a Catholic or you're an Orthodox. And so, never been done before in a heavy Catholic, heavy Orthodox church, uh, church area. We went out for 90 minutes knocking on doors. That's it, an hour and a half. Now, I don't know if you can tell here, but you can see some of the faces. They're a little excited, a little bit nervous. Uh, this guy doesn't, he doesn't look too sure about what's going on. There was a nervous excitement. There were people that were doubters, and there were some that were excited. Most were not. And we didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to think. It had never been done before. And after 90 minutes, Guess how many Bible studies we got. Now, keep in mind, never been done before in the Ukraine. Keep in mind, heavy Catholic, heavy Orthodox. How many Bible studies do you think they got? How many? 20? Praise the Lord. 50? Praise the Lord. How many? 300. Praise the Lord. How many? Anyone else? 67. Good number, I guess. We would have been happy with 67. In 90 minutes... We got 365 Bible studies, close. One for every day of the week. <laughs> 365 in 90 minutes. Now, one thing went through my head, two things went through my head. One was what that pastor said to me years ago. You can't do this in the Ukraine. This is not America. And I thought, oh, he doesn't know how right he was. <laughs> you would never get 365 studies in 90 minutes in America. <laughs> Second, do you know what that atmosphere was like in that church that day? It was electric. You could see, so we called people up, church members, for, to give testimonies. This one lady gets up and, you know, I have a translator, and she's saying, I got seven Bible studies and I connected with this one lady and, oh, by the way, you're not getting these. I'm keeping these. Another lady gets up, five Bible studies. You're not getting these. I'm keeping these. They all wanted to keep the Bible studies. The first thing that came to my mind after what the pastor said is what I just read, Desire of Ages 825. The very life of the church depends on our faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. You want to bring life to your church? You want to bring life to our young people? We're leave, losing our young people by the busload from the time, the transition period from high school to college. That's where we're losing all our young people, by the busload. Get them involved in evangelism. I always, whenever I talk to young people in that period, I always, always tell them, you need to go to an evangelism school. We'd love to have you at NETS, but you don't have to come to NETS. Go to AFCO, go to Arise. Go to an evangelism school before you step foot on that college campus and you watch and see what's going to happen when you now go to college. You will be grounded. You will be refocused. You will be on fire when you go on that college campus, and you will be a lot stronger young person in your Christian walk than you were if you, if you just go into a college. Because it doesn't matter the college. We're losing our young people when they step foot on the colleges. I'm not saying it's the college, but it's a transition period. And so the very life of the church depends on our faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. These two young guys, you can't see it really well, but on the left is Dennis, or Denise, and that is Edic on the right. These two young men, and they, were, they came to this training in the Ukraine. Now, interesting, they were leaders amongst their peers, their young people in their mid-20s, and whatever these guys do, the young people follow. They belong to a church that was called Mamayevsa Church. Whenever you mention the word Mamayevsa to the, to the conference in the Ukraine, the leaders would just cringe because anything went in this church. It was a church that had a lot of money, which is rare in the Ukraine, and it was a church filled with young people, another rarity. And so in that church, they had every kind of music, they had every, you name it, it was going on in that church, and it was just a disaster. And these two young people came to this training, and at the end of the training, they were lit on fire. They were converted. As a matter of fact, Dennis here, Denise, 
was on probation at the time he came to the training. The church had put him on probation because him and a few of his buddies jumped somebody and beat him up and just a, just a disaster. They came to the training. They got involved in evangelism. They were converted and they ended up coming to our AFCO school. And then after the AFCO school, when they graduated, they went back to Mamayevsa church. They trained all the young people in that church to do evangelism. They held an evangelistic city in this small village. And at one point, they had over 40 Bible studies that they were giving in this small village. Young people. They preached a series. At the end of that series, they had about 12 baptisms. One of them was an Orthodox priest. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Eastern Europe. You've seen these Orthodox priests. They're, they're, they're basically mafia is what they are. They're, they're all hitmen. I remember I was, we were doing a series one time, and I was standing outside of the hall um, talking with people, and I see this black Mercedes pull up, all decked out. And so I'm watching it, and this guy, get, a couple of guys get out, and they have, they, they're wearing all black, and he's got all these gold chains, and they look like gangsters, and they're big, rough-looking guys. All of a sudden, they open the trunk, and they pull out all their priestly garments. And they put their priestly garments on, and they came into the meeting to try and shut us down. And so they're gangsters, these guys. And so at the end of that series, with young people preaching, an Orthodox priest gets baptized, becomes Seventh-day Adventist. And you know what it was initially? According to him, he said, because he lived right next to the church, he said, every night I would come home, and I would hear this beautiful music coming from your church as they were singing the hymns. And so he would sit outside on his porch and listen to the music because it was beautiful. And then he would listen to the sermons. And then slowly but surely he started attending the meetings and he gets baptized from these couple of young people. So the very life of the church depends on her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. Luke chapter 2 and verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is what? Great. So what's the problem? The laborers are few. So, let me ask you a question. You know, everywhere I go, oh, Kevin, you know, that's great, this happened there, but you can't do that here. You know, this is so-and-so. This is, you know, it's difficult here. I've never entered a territory where somebody said, oh, man, it's so easy here, you're going to be a piece of cake. Everybody says it's the same thing, it's very difficult here. But is the problem the territories? Is the problem the postmodern mind? No. The problem is... The laborers are few. The harvest truly is great. The problem is that the laborers are few. Therefore, the Lord, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So number seven, evangelism is heaven's means of reaching lost people. I want to share this story with you. I was doing a church training. One of my, matter of fact, it was my very first church training coming out of AFCO, and I'm so thankful none of you were there because it was probably the worst church training in the history of, wor of church trainings in our church. I had no idea what I was doing. And um, anyways, the Lord blessed. He was merciful. About 30 people came out. One of the people that came out was a young man, Clark. Clark had done everything in his life. He was a police officer. He had worked in restaurants and, and hotels and drove a truck. And you name it, this guy did it. And Clark was scared to death to go out door to door. But he knew that God was calling him to do this. And so we went through the training and came time to go out door to door. So I decided I would be Clark's partner because he was a nervous wreck. And so I mapped out a territory for him and we, uh, the day we're going out, I had him in the pastor's office and kind of giving him the rah-rah, getting him encouraged and firing him up. We got out there. And I would do the doors first, and then I would hand it over to him when he felt comfortable. So I did a few doors, and he says, okay, I'm ready, Kevin. And I was surprised, because it was kind of early. And I said, are you sure, Clark? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do this. So we come to that first door, a woman answers. He freezes. <laughs> so I'm, all of a sudden, he just freezes. And I just start praying. Lord, help him. Please help put the right words in his mouth. And he finally opens his mouth. He says, we're not Jehovah's Witness. 
I can assure you that was not in the training. And so I looked, and I looked at her, and I just started praying. And she says, well, I am, gentlemen. What can I do for you? She was a JW. <laughs> what are the odds of that? <laughs> Guess what we didn't get? <laughs> we didn't get a Bible study. And so we, we left the door, and I said, Clark, what happened? He's like, I don't know, I froze, and, and I, that's all I could think of saying. So anyways, he kept doing it, and he started getting better and better, but we weren't having any success. Doors being closed, you know, it was California, and a lot of areas in California there, uh, people aren't as friendly as out here on the East Coast. And um, anyway, so I could see he's getting discouraged. So I said, Clark, let's stop for a little while, because we were coming to the end of his territory. I said, let's just pray. Pray that God would give us a divine appointment. So we prayed about it, and we continued on. We come to the, almost the last house, and we have John here down the bottom. You can't really see him, but that's John. He's an older gentleman, sweetest guy you'll ever meet. So we come to the door. John answers the door, and we go through the canvas with him, and we're in the survey now. Now, it's a religious survey, which I don't use anymore, by the way. I don't use the religious surveys anymore, especially here in the East Coast. Um, Anyways, we'll talk about that later. So, so it's a religious survey. First question, do you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. Second question, is there a Bible in your house? He said, yeah, there's a Bible in my house. Third question, how often do you get a chance to read it? And he looked at us, he says, you know, I try to read it every day, but I just can't understand it. Fourth question, if you had the opportunity, would you like to better understand the Bible? And his eyes opened up. He said, guys, you are not gonna believe this. When you knocked on my door, I was trying to understand my Bible, and I asked God to help me understand it. You guys knocked on my door, and now you're asking me if I'd like to better understand the Bible. Yes, I would like to better understand the Bible. That was what we call a divine appointment. We got the Bible study. We go back the next week, and Clark is giving the Bible study, and I will tell you, so we got the Bible study booklet. Clark, I've never seen somebody as nervous as him. He's... I'm sorry. And, and he's on the front page, there's a story, and he can't get through the story, he can't read it, because he's got that golf ball, or it was a softball for him, and I've been there. I used to have a public speaking phobia. And so he's <laughs> reading a couple, ver uh, couple uh, words, and it was painful. And I'm just praying, Lord, please help him calm his nerves, and so on. And 10 minutes, we're on this front page that he can't read. And so finally he stops and he says, John, I'm so sorry. This is the first time I've ever given a Bible study to somebody. And John looked at him in the eyes. He said, this is great. This is the first time anyone's ever given me a Bible study. And right then I could see the boulder lifted off of Clark's chest and he relaxed. And man, he gave a pretty good Bible study, that first Bible study. And we continue going week after week. The series comes John comes to the series, brought a friend, and at the end of that series, John gets baptized. About a year after that, so this is California. I'm now back in Massachusetts. About a, almost a year to the baptism, the date of his baptism, Clark calls me. He says, Kevin, hey, do you remember John? I said, of course I remember John. How's he doing? He was the sweetest guy. He said, well, he went into the hospital because he had shoulder pain. And the doctors told him his whole body was racked with cancer and there was nothing they could do for him. And three weeks later, he died. And all I could think was praise God. Amen. Clark, praise God that you did not allow your fear to stop you from going door to door. What if you did? We might not have reached him. You did not allow your fear and because of that, we are going to see Clark in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Ellen White says this in Acts of the Apostles 109. There are many who are reading the scriptures who cannot understand their true import. This was John. All over the world. Where? All over the world except for Caribou, Maine and except for wherever you're from. Is that what it says? Maybe that's the newer translations. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, only waiting to be gathered in. There are multitudes of people where you are that are on the verge of the kingdom, only waiting to be gathered in. There are many people trying to read the scriptures that can't understand them. And that's where we come in.
That's our job. Desire of Ages 141. Many have gone down to ruin who might have been saved if their neighbors, common men and women, had put forth personal effort for them. Many are waiting to be personally addressed in the very family, the neighborhood, the town where we live. There is work for us to do as missionaries. Many people will go down into Christless graves if we are not out there trying to help them. Many are on the kingdom, verge of the kingdom, just waiting to be gathered in. And that's where we come in. You know, last night we read the love of many would grow cold in our church. The result of that is we're not out there. The result of that is we're self-centered. We have a bigger focus on my preparation to get to heaven rather than getting other people to heaven. Many are on the verge of the kingdom. What are we going to do about that? You know, you're not here by chance. I'm not here by chance. I believe God ordained every speaker to be here this summer and every teacher to be here and for you to be here because he wants to light fires in all of us and help us to see our, our calling. And our calling is to be soul winners at some level. That's why we're here. Uh, it's 3 o'clock. Let's pray. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about relationships and evangelism. You do not want to miss this. It is vital. And, and you are going to see something tomorrow, a beautiful picture tomorrow that makes soul winning so simple. And I'm going to share some incredible stories about this tomorrow. And then Friday, we're going to go through, we're going to get into our Bibles and, and, and I'm going to show you how to make a Bible study personal to somebody, which is vital. And then with what you're learning tomorrow and Friday, you watch and see when you study the Bible with somebody. I don't care if they're a Catholic or if they're a Muslim. I've studied with Muslims before, you, and we'll talk about that. You watch and see how simple it is, how simple it is to win people when we do it the right way. Instead of focusing on the doctrine, doctrine's extremely important, but focus on the heart instead of the doctrine, and the doctrine will come, you watch and see. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that we were able to finish on time. I thank you, Father, that your presence was here with us, and I thank you that you've ordained each one of us to be here at this special time in the world's history. Lord, I thank you for the plans that you have for each one of our lives. Your plans are always so much bigger than our plans that we have for our lives. And for whatever reason, Lord, you've chosen each one of us to, to be alive at this time. You could have created us 500 B.C., but you created each one of us at this very specific time in the world's history to be alive in these very last days, and you've given us a specific purpose. Help us to see this picture as we continue in this camp meeting, whether it's uh, through more classes and the preaching and, and, and through everything, Lord. Help us to see the bigger picture for our lives and give us that love for, for people that you need us to have. We thank you. We ask that you continue to strive with us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. And uh, we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. And you won't want to miss it. If you have any questions for me or comments, please come and see me uh, now. I don't want to... Oh, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to take anybody else's time. God bless you all.